Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this Saturday morning. Um, I hope you all are feeling good. I know it's pretty foggy in Portland per usual. Um, so today we're going to be talking with Ali Melenciano about some of her work around technology, race, imagination, utopia, all those good things that we want to talk about. Um, so I'm just going to give a nice little bio on her. Ali Melenciano is an artist, designer, creative technologist, researcher, and educator who is passionate about exploring the relationships between various forms of design and sentient experiences. Currently, her research is within synthesis of human computer interactive technologies, architecture, Afrocentric design practices, experimental pedagogy, and Black radical imagination. Ari is the founder of Afrotechtopia, a social institution fostering interdisciplinary innovation at the intersections of art, design, technology, Black culture, and activism through collaboration, um, research, and practice. She currently teaches creative technology and design at NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program, NYU's Department of Digital Photography and Imaging, Pratt Institute's Communications Design School, and Hunter's College's Integrated Media Arts MFA Program. All right, um, thank you so much for joining us today. And I know I speak for everyone that we're so excited for this talk. Thank you, excited to join you all too. Um, so um, as was mentioned, I'm Adi Melenciano and I'll talk a little bit about my work on omni-specialized design in it, um, omni-specialized and imaginative design. And to give context as far as who I am, um, even more context than what was shared before, um, I grew up as someone that just loved to, to create, very much identified as an artist before anything else, and found that design and creative technology were really great tools for me to expand on the possibilities of art where um, art could enter people's lives and ideally better people's lives. And a lot of my work also stems from research. So on the screen, you see a few different concentric circles where research is then right above of um, constantly learning new facets of life and ways to bring those into the work that I was doing and believing that art is just a, a great vehicle for dissemination of information to the masses in a way that's much more easily digestible than you know reading papers and journals. Um, and education is a place that I love to continue exploring art and design and creative technology and research because I'm, I'm able to bring all of these different interests together and design different courses and then um, see what students come up with. And, and being in a classroom, I feel like I'm constantly, whether I'm the professor or not, just constantly the, the student because I get to see what my students are creating. So I'll be sharing a little bit about um, my lecture media practice, research, um, my pedagogical practice, and then how all of that really comes together in building Afrotectopia. So with my electro media practice, um, I have grown uh, grown up as a person that just loves sound. And so what you see on the screen are a few different sculptures um, that I've created with acrylic and plastic and like all sorts of other materials and infuse them with sensors, a variety of different sensors. Because for me, I'm, I'm often exploring um, and really invested in how technology, creative technology can allow there to be this um, conversation between the artist and the viewer where the viewer no longer has to be just that, just the role of the viewer, but they can and then have a conversation back with the artist and um, removes that dichotomy and allows them to create with what the artist has created. So this is a, um, series of sound sculptures that I was exploring and creating were as an artist of just loving to create things that are aesthetically pleasing, but then wanting them to not be just um, aesthetically pleasing, but utilitarian and functional. So uh, a lot of my work is considering how can I make art functional and allow other people to create with it as well. And so these are a few other um, sound sculptures are just like the different perspectives of them and the process in building them. So you see a picture of um, what was once my desk in my studio and um, bringing in a variety of different materials together because it's really about, it's often about a blend of shapes and colors and uh, material and then fusing in different sensors to then produce whether it's light outputs or sound outputs. So these, as you touch the different potentiometers or sensors, they would then control the sound that you were hearing um, in response to your movement. And so I've continued to expand on this project of, or this idea of sound sculptures. Um, and so what you also see on the screen now are um, on the left side, a do-rag 
um, on, on the head of a mannequin with an Afro pick coming out of it. And then on the right side, you see a bunch of other sculptures that are using hair rollers and um, bamboo earrings and Afro picks, all things that I've either fabricated myself with a laser cutter or have purchased at a beauty supply shop. And at this time I was thinking a lot about, um, I'm generally always thinking about black culture and my love of it. And um, it, it often inspires the work that I do. But in this context or in this situation, I was thinking about how um, black culture has such a context that is constructed of it by white gaze and um, what outside communities feel um, towards this black community or you know, its interpretation through mass media. And um, often it's a very negative and stigmatizing um, construction when it's when it's the observation of black cultural artifacts worn on black bodies. When it's black cultural artifacts worn on other bodies, it has this like cool element to it in a whole different context. But when it's in its own element, there's a very negative stigma. And I was thinking about for me growing up um, as someone that was using hair rollers all the time to curl my hair. With friends, I would always wear bamboo earrings and seeing do-rags all the time and Afro picks always around. Um, of just like that love and sentimental um, appreciation for these artifacts um, and a love of their beauty, but also an acknowledgement of how other people don't see the beauty. So I wanted to recontextualize it, get it outside of its current contextual standpoint and put it into an entirely new realm by creating these sculptures that give it a whole new environment. And so it's infusing. And then beyond the new environment, it's also infusing culture, uh, technology into these sound sculptures. So as you touch the hair rollers or you touch the do-rag or you touch the bamboo earrings, sound of African drum pattern music is then being played. So it's again, removing this dichotomy between the artist of um, the original creator and then the viewer, but now the viewer can also engage with the work that the art has, artist has done and create something new um, themselves. So also expanded to do other sculptures like this, where you have um, a pyramid with braided hair coming out. And for, for me, I think often about this project a lot of how um, this piece particularly because um, it can often be very, it's always insulting. You, you should never touch, it's a thing of never touching a black person's hair because it can come off as very condescending or like looking at them as a sort of animal or exotic being. Um, and it's often done without even asking for permission. Um, so with this, I was creating a situation where you can actually, you are invited, encouraged to touch the hair of what would presumably be a black person and um, creating a, a whole different context of maybe the reason why you can't touch it is because there's a whole element of magic within it and in your interaction with it. So as you touch this piece of hair, again, sound is being played. Um, so it's creating like this mystical element around these different culture artifacts. And on, on the right, you see a bed, um, a, a, a bed that I've created out of acrylic, um, like a flat uh, rectangular prism where there are different, um, Afro picks on top of it. And in the Afro picks, I've infused sort of um, technological DNA. So within each Afro pick, it has its own data. And that data is when it's put on top of this bed that I've constructed, it'll project different visuals that you would see. So each Afro pick then having its own um, visual language that comes out of it. Um, and so then in a more recent project, um, and a, a re more recent area that I've been exploring, especially in the time of quarantine has been um, designing environments in the web and what that would, um, the experience of that. And so I was thinking about that, particularly in the time of the, you know, the, the um, climax of the second uprising of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, this past summer and listening to a lot of chants like things like I can't breathe or no justice, no peace and understanding that these are really cathartic actions being done of like chanting these, these phrases in union with hundreds of other people in the middle of the street, but also recognizing that us constantly saying things like I can't breathe or no justice, no peace are also uh, manifest themselves as affirmations. The more you say something and think something to be true, the more that it becomes true. And not to say that um, the horrific uh, suppressions and oppressions that were happening were not happening and, and not to say that not acknowledging them would mean that they um, are not happening, but it means to say that if we, the way that we approach activism can actually harm us and um, contain us in our ability to imagine and heal ourselves. So I was thinking about that and then wanted to create a space where I could um, engage in this, these ideas and allow other people to come in and heal themselves through this form of technology. So had been uh, exploring and researching the effects of turmoil and pain on the body. 
and how in these moments, in these intense moments, um, Black people being like just seeing these imagery online everywhere of people that look just like them being harmed in such horrific ways. Um, but also we have this background knowledge of this stuff existing all the time. And then we also have this ancestral knowledge of that all of that having, we, we carry this burden within our DNA. What does that do to us is what I was exploring. And this idea of epigenetics of how being the study of changes of organisms caused by the modification of gene expression rather than an alteration of genetic code itself. So how the experiences that we're going through are inevitably changing the way that we are constructed internally. Um, so I wanted to create an environment with through sound and color that could create a positive epigenetical experience. Um, and this was creating the name of Metamorphosis FM because it's, a, it's about a larger change where metamorphosis within itself and it's using frequency modulation. So frequency, sound frequency, where I am um, had researched a variety of different sound frequencies that actually tie directly to different energy centers. And if you're of the um, Eastern philosophy, you might hear our spiritual practices, you would hear them being called chakras. And so how each of our chakras or energy centers, they all have their own um, particular sound that allows to you know, direct, be directed exactly to that one. And so using sound and color to create this environment that would um, directly and intentionally heal ourselves. And so as I mentioned, um, setting the different chakras and sofagio um, frequencies and alignment between sound and healing and also bringing in African drum patterns because historically and knowing that African drum patterns have been tools that have and technologies within themselves that have carried the diaspora through revolutions like through the Haitian revolution and the use of the talking drum or djembe and that being a communication tool that slave masters could not interpret but that enslaved Africans were able to understand. And so I also, as a student of architecture um, and someone that just generally loves to learn about psychogeography and how the design of a space can actually make us feel scientifically, I wanted to consider that in the construction of this space of how can I make sure that the engagement and the, the journey within this space could allow people to feel relaxed and calm as opposed to stressed out or aggravated. Um, and so I went into designing the music and as a, I do a lot of work with sound, as I mentioned before, and so bring in different machines that I have, whether it's a modular synthesizer or a beat machine or um, a MIDI controller and just building out these different soundscapes that were infusing both African drum pattern music and different sound frequencies. And so then it was going into designing the space. So again, in studying psychogeography of how um, when you create spaces, when spaces um, have very high ceilings, people tend to feel like they are, um, like they, they understand that their existence within the world is a bit smaller. It's a, a, a humility stories of experience. And you also feel that you're in the midst of something great. Um, so you often, when you enter a church or maybe a, a, like a, a kind of, um, generally churches have this a lot of like arenas, they're very high ceilings. And so you're in, you feel like you're in the midst of something very, um, very uh, substantial. And so I wanted to mimic that as well. And then also thinking about curvular um, structures because curves tend to allow people to feel more relaxed and calm. So in designing this space, it was a web VR experience. So I rendered it in a 3D software and then I brought it into the internet and uploaded it. So you can navigate through the space um, orthogonic uh, from X and Y axis and Y -X, uh, Z axis. So you can move around through your mouse keys um, and the sound is spatialized. So I also, as I created that sound, I then implemented it into the space so that the spheres, they all have, they all contain um, the sound, the soundscapes. And so as you get closer to those spheres, you'll hear um, sound that is tying specifically to the root chakra, if you're in the, near the red sphere, and then also an African drum pattern um, that would play. And if you're going to the orange, then you might, you would hear um, the frequency specifically to the sacral, and then you would continue moving. Um, and you would no longer hear the root. So every time you got closer to the next sphere, you would no longer hear the other spheres. Um, and so then with research and pedagogy, and as I mentioned, like, as you could see this, this project, this past project took a lot of research and understanding um, how all of these different elements could possibly tie together. And also it just takes a lot of research before that of not even finding the similarities, but even just understanding that these things exist. So a lot of my just general practice and life practice is in the midst of a lot of just reading and learning and, and seeing what things are going on in the world. And sometimes that knowledge is used more immediately than others, but it's, it's generally just keeping kind of a, a database of what's happening and how do things work and operate with each other. So um, more recently, some of my research uh, 
areas have been in pedagogy as an educator, I love to just continuously learn or what are some of the most holistic and comprehensive approaches to pedagogy and creating a conducive, healthy and conducive classroom environment. Other spaces that I've been exploring are um, with this book, Low Tech Design by Radical Indigenism by Julia Watson, which is a book that I've loved. It's so beautifully bounded and composed for one, but just the, the context within it, um, all the information that's that's done and research that's done on different indigenous groups around the world and all the practices that they've done that are so um, directly considerate of the earth and ways that we as people that are have removed ourselves from this non-Indigenous practice, we um, just have so much to learn from. And Hidden Life of Trees, which has also been a really enlightening read on the way that natural systems communicate with one another. And as someone that I'm, I'm often looking at nature and the way that the world has naturally constructed to find ways I can use those elements and um, technologies that are natural technologies into other tools and systems and communities that I'm building. And so for me, um, it's a lot about understanding whole systems, which is something that Stuart Brand and um, the creator behind the Whole Earth Catalog, and for anyone that does know the Whole Earth Catalog, the Whole Earth Catalog was a, um, a creation in the 70s, in the, in the midst of the Vietnam War, um, where Stuart Brand was thinking a lot about communes and the people that were living on communes, which happened to be his friends, and how these people were removing themselves from society because they were in such angst towards what the states were doing politically within the Vietnam War, um, and how he wanted, he also had a love for almanacs and how they contained a variety of different information in one space and one entity, and wanted to create a, a version of his own where you're, he's bringing in a whole bunch of information that would help people that are living in the commune. So, understanding about things like cybernetics or how to build a chair or how to construct your own home or how to build a geodesic dome. A lot of just a variety of different information within one entity um, and kind of, I don't know if he coined it or if maybe Buckminster Fuller, I can't remember who coined it, but this idea of this whole systems kind of practice. And even before learning about them, that's just a way that I've practiced and, and learning that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to a lot of different subjects and not be so siloed. Um, but I found a lot of uh, alignment between Stuart Brand's work and Buckminster Fuller's work and, and Victor Papanek's work on design and how we can think of it very intentionally. Um, and just how everything is connected. And so this is also an image of the whole catalog and it's um, when it was actually um, in printing, this one from 1968. And the whole catalog is also actually credited um, by Steve Jobs to have been kind of like the seed of what exists now as Google. Um, and the internet that we know of it today of like this central node that allows us to understand a variety of different information by accessing that one space. And so my other work has been in exploring African fractals, which has been a really exciting space for me to explore, especially as a black person living in a Eurocentric society where we're often taught that, you know, things that are coming out of the African continent have always been primitive and all the geniusness has started on the European continent and the enlightenment and all of these things of just like how we're, the whole, so much of academia and the structure of education and our understanding of intellectualism is so rooted in the Afrocentric kind of assumption that completely negates the contributions that Africans have done historically well before um, people of European descent even knew what these things were. So things like um, fractal mathematics, like when European um, colonizers were entering the continent of Africa and observing the ways that African communities were living and they were in a, a condition where it looked like they were kind of just sprawled out in an unorganized fashion, but actually it was a form of fractal mathematics that the European um, colonizers weren't even aware of, they, that they didn't understand that sort of mathematics. And the only place that fractal mathematics was being conducted was on the African continent um, and in India. So to know that these sort of mathematical um, happenings were, hap were existing well beyond other people understood what they were. It was really fascinating for me and to understand how things like um, corn rolling or games like Mancala, which I actually grew up playing, were all forms of mathematics. Um, and so understanding that our, the African life has been so rooted in mathematics and the African life um, is what seeded a lot of the computing that we know of today. The reason why we have been are able to do a lot of computing is through the mathematics that existed within the continent. So um, in bringing all this research together, what I've been exploring in a more recent project um, is understanding the internet as an experience. So not this purely utilitarian tool. So this is kind of just like what you see on the screen is just a, a bunch of texts of just these different ideas that I've been thinking about surrounding this one project that I'm building out now um, about biomimicry, about communication and information, 
um, about exploring the internet that's not curated based off of your behavior. So evading this idea of surveillance capitalism, where with surveillance capitalism is so successful at understanding who you are and how to get you to the information that you are more likely seeking. Um, but it removes this opportunity for spontaneous discovery. So I'm exploring how can the internet be an experience where it's not so much about getting from A to B, but it's about learning a variety of different information outside of what you would have, would have even sought to learn about. Um, and also about architecture and psychogeography of this, the internet does not have to be this flat space where it's just you clicking on different hyperlinks, but it can actually be an architectural environment. It can be similar to walking down the street. It doesn't have to be, you know, clicking on a, a link, but it could be um, jogging and moving and seeing a, um, some sort of architectural structure that you're then able to enter as a portal to then get to a different environment. So in building out this project, it's, it's returned to a lot of other research, whether it's on, um, again, back with the whole earth, uh, field guide or catalog and politics of design or Buckminster Fuller's architecture in the age of radio or places of the heart by um, Colin Ellard that talks a lot about psychogeography or even villages of West Africa and how um, they're you know getting outside of the Eurocentric architectural canon but looking at what other communities have done with architecture and then pedagogy because of this space being a, an environment that's meant to expose people and an experimental form of pedagogy or even just studying the relationships between Ujamaa villages in Tanzania that are all about socialism and creating this collective um, collective empowerment and trees and how trees and the ways that they um, grow interspecially um, are perform a, a way of uh, socialism within themselves of how they take care of one another through their roots. So um, this quote really ties um, in this slide I have text, a bunch of text, and this quote is bold, and, and it says, the only humane and effective way to break the negative grip of antique culture is with information. So again, it's showing how so many facets of life are um, actually very interconnected in ways that we are taught that they are and are taught to not pay attention to. And so for me, it's a focus of how can we um, de destroy really these paradigms of um, like, and destroy these kind of echo chambers and ways of existing where we think that everyone thinks like us, but instead, let's break that. Let's, you know, create some paradigm shifts. Let's remove this antique culture and through that, through the exposition of information. So again, as I mentioned, I'm just designing architecture for digital environments. So creating these kind of architectural elements that would then exist within the space. And so here being um, a bunch of different architectural elements that I've created, and then I've put into um, 3JS, uh, like a, 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 a library using JavaScript that would allow you to bring in kind of, um, you can make effects, computer effects with it, but you can also bring in 3D rendered elements into a virtual and create a virtual space online. And so thinking about how these different objects and architectural renderings could then be portals within themselves. So maybe as you move through these um, objects, you could then see um, you could then be led to another environment that is exploring information that's very interdisciplinary. So maybe one leading to quantum mechanics with sound design or another leading to environmentalism and Dadaism of how those two can potentially have a relationship between each other. Um, and so often when I share this research, it's in the form of a presentation and I'm exploring how can I get out of it for presenting this work in a form of a presentation on Ami specialized design, but create an embodied example of what Ami specialized design is. But to go into a bit of the research that I've done with Ami specialized design with you all, it's a lot about how can we think very critically about Ami specialized design and imagining and designing more beautiful futures. And so when I do these presentations, I often start with this quote of how of, from Benjamin Bratton, who's a theorist and philosopher. And he says, the job of design in the 21st century is to undo much of the design of the 20th century. And I think this proved to be especially um, plausible now in the midst of the uprisings that I mentioned in the States and how people were very frustrated with the system and, and recognizing that it's truly not serving them and it was never designed to serve them, but how we always have and continue to have the agency to object that and create new systems. And so that's really what uh, I think we need to focus critically on within the design practice of today is, yes, this has existed for centuries and maybe not even a whole century, but it's so ingrained in our society that it's become a very flushed out status quo, but we always have the potential to change it, especially because it was only a human that created that, like, you know, this, this law that we have, that we practice, this way of being, it's a human that had told us that we should create this. And so inherently there is some sort of flaw and we can always challenge it to improve it and make it um, better serving for our lives. 
And so it's also about the rethinking design of what is the role of a designer, which is often misinterpreted as this kind of lone wolf, this visionary, this like person that everyone should look to, or what are the principles of design that we're building off of and what are ways that we can design. So when we're thinking about the role of a designer, um, Victor Papanek, who I mentioned before, because I shared his work on the politics of design, mentioned that design has to be done by team. This team must not consist of only somebody who is a designer, it must consist of people from other disciplines. And I think this is especially important for us to think of in our design practices of, we often think um, it's not even just the, that we need to have a design group if we're, if we're an architectural studio. We don't just need to have architects and structural engineers and um, you know all these other people in the room and urban designers and landscape architects. The, the, that's not a comprehensive design system. What's actually a comprehensive design system are what teachers would actually be teaching within this school that we're designing, or um, what are like what um, what neighbors, uh, whatever their job roles would be, what are what would bus drivers um, think uh, about the design that's being developed because they're the ones that are going to drive on the street that's looking at this every day and have to drop people off. Like who are who's everyone that would have a stake in this? And let's make sure that we're we're bringing all of them in. Um, and even if they don't have a stake, they have something to contribute. They have an expertise that maybe that we maybe don't identify with, but they, we could learn a lot from. So maybe a scientist or a biotechnologist and what, what can they bring into the table? And Victor Papanek also uh, continues this quote by saying, and the most important team member besides the design nur is a member of the user group. And I, I scratch out user group, user, the word is a very common word used in um, technology and like building. Um, different technologies, but for me, I feel like um, it flattens the dimensionality of the person that's that's engaging with this product or tool, and it makes it seem like you know all the users are the same. So really, it's about who's the intended beneficiary, um, and I think it, it's really important that Victor Papanik was stressing this, even if he was using user. It's really a semantic point, but even if he was using user, it's a really important idea to stress because oftentimes the way that we practice design is we think. Uh, we went to this prestigious school, we know all these, you know, famous designers, and we were taught by this incredible professor. So we know exactly what we're doing. And, you know, this community that we're entering, you guys should step aside and let's, um, let's teach you how to, you know, live better. And we're, and when, when design studios and groups and collectives are doing that, what they're really doing is an imperialism, and they are entering a space and thinking that they know all the answers and that this, the intelligence of the community that they're entering is ignorant would really it's completely the opposite. And the, the community that has lived there for all of these years, they know their culture, they know what, what inspired them, they know what, where they wanna live, they know how they wanna live, they know how their community operates, they know. So it's really about the design group, making sure that they're understanding as much as possible about the group, the community that they may be entering um, because they truly are the most important person if you wanna design in a successful form. And so as mentioned before, design has to be something that is multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary in every facet. And so really what Victor Papanek stresses is that the designer's role is merely a bridge and not merely, but it, it, it largely is consisted of being a bridge, a mediated role amongst um, different disciplines. So the designer is able to create a shared language between the historian and the artist and the engineer and the community member and the scientist and the artist. So they're, they're understanding the gist of every practice and then they're able to bring all of that together to create something cohesive. And as Mel also mentioned, it's about designing with not for. So it's not about entering communities and saying, this is how to do it. It's about entering communities and saying, how do you do it? Um, and so what are principles that we're designing, that we're building design off of? Um, well, since the European enlightenment and industrial, industrialization and capitalism, um, there's been a mythology of technology that Julia Watson really excellently expands on in the low tech radical indigenism book that I've shared. Um, where we think technology is like this, this core intersection of humanism, colonialism, and racism, which inherently produced capitalism. But actually, technology has always existed. It's not something that just came about in the industrial era. It's technology is indigenous innovation, and it's ancestral intelligence, and it's found in local wisdom. It's found within people that understand um, systems and the way that they've heard, or the, the way that they have existed over centuries. Um, so indigenous communities, they understand the technologies of the earth better than any of us um, can, but they're often the ones that are the quickest to be ignored and thought of as, um, you know, a, an inconvenience within productivity and capitalism. So it's really about how can we no longer have the severance of technology between all these productive tools and the, the, the roots and elements that they actually came out of. Um, and Dory Turnstall often quote, um, when cons considering de design, Dory 
is the Dean of Ontario's College of Art and Design. And Dory says, um, Dean Dory says, why are we creating these boundaries between the human and the non-human, the flora and fauna and the supernatural? Are there other values or principles that we can take into account that will bring us closer as opposed to creating divisions? Because for a really, really long time, we've been designing with the exclusion of all other life forms. And so for me, this becomes really important. This, this quote has summed up a lot of my thinkings um, around the way that we practice design and how we think that design has to be this um, practice that's only thinking about us as humans and no one else and no other being. And so um, that's why I stress in my bio, of, I'm, I'm really invested in design and its relationship with sentient beings of all beings and how does that how does it engage with all living beings on the planet. And so it's really about moving away from human-centered design and thinking more about ecologically-centered design. Human-centered design is great when you're creating technologies that really only a human would use. Okay, that's perfect to think about how a human might use it. But I think this idea of human-centered design has taken over every way that we're designing and we think about it um, without any consideration as far as any other living being on the planet. We're not thinking about architecture um, or other built environment um, practices or, you know, um, producing items or products or any of these things in relation to other sentient beings. So it's really about how can we think about the ecology in one breath. Um, in my research practice and pedagogical practice, it stresses how when you're interdisciplinary, it gives a much fuller picture. And so when you're interdisciplinary, it also um, reveals blind spots. And in studies and sciences, when we think about science within itself, it's very easy to think that science is this kind of political subject. I mean, a political subject, like it, everything has to be just fact because it's science. But science is actually always political. There's always a lens in which the science is being interpreted within. So there isn't always a political element within it. And we especially realize that when we study humanities, of humanities and, and things like anthropology, which um, we could really sum up as um, mostly white people entering other communities and studying the way that they operate and then writing some books about it, right? That's generally the practice of what anthropology is. But when we think about um, anthropology in a, a subversion of it or through a different lens, we understand um, that it's not about um, this one perspective, this dominant perspective, um, defining another perspective that seems foreign to it, but that is really important that we have multiple perspectives. And I bring that in because there was this thing called cybernetics, or is this thing called cybernetics? Um, and cybernetics is basically the seed of artificial intelligence because it, it understood, it was created by Norbert Wiener, and it was understood that with any system, there's a feedback loop. So there's a cause and effect. When you do something, something's going to happen because of it. But through an anthropologist, uh, Margaret Mead, an anthropologist, a pro prolific one at the time, understood that um, cybernetics just doesn't exist within its bubble, that it's not just about this feedback loop that exists, but that it's someone that is interpreting this feedback loop, um, someone that's observing this feedback loop has a particular interpretation that is developed through their lived experience and their way and their po politics and their ways of being. And so it, it was a creation of a second wave cybernetics that understood that an observation of anything is going to be interpreted through a lens that has politics ingrained into it and that we need to recognize that factor within it. So when we think about sciences, we need to understand that um, it's being done through a political lens and, and someone that's interpreting it is, is bringing in their own biases and in their interpretation. And so all of that just to stress how we really need to um, understand that nothing is apolitical, that the way that we look at things, we're bringing in our politics, and that we need to have multiple perspectives to understand something in its fuller breadth. And so that's what I tend to do with the classes that I build, one being the revolution will be digitized. So this class is not, it, it, the gist of it is, is that we're studying the social impacts of and societal impacts of technology, and we're learning about how technology um, can impact the way of life for a variety of different people. But if within our studies, we're also studying surveillance. So how the internet started off as a surveillance tool in the Vietnam War or public policy, um, and how public policy actually stems from um, historical practices of urban design and um, you know real estate or sociology, public policy and sociology are hand in hand in a lot of ways, or the ecology of information or, or design and um, military and media and all these other entities that we generally wouldn't think have much to do with societal impacts of technology, but that have always have existed in the same realm. Um, and so images here I have are Norbert Wiener, as I mentioned, the creator of um, uh, creator of cybernetics or coining the, the term. And then we have um, this 
this other this person in the middle who would identify probably as a hippie was during the counterculture era and there um in this class i also talk a lot about the relationship between counterculture and um the development of technology especially the internet and then we also have joe scott Haran on the right who um i created the course based off of uh, joe scott Haran's work so um joe scott Haran had a song called the revolution will not be televised and so this is thinking about how the revolution could actually be um, done through technology or explored through technology in different ways. And also teaching a, designing a course called and teaching a course called designing club culture. So this one's about, um, it's very similar to the revolution course. So that one's about technology and counterculture, but in a negative way of how, um, or just understanding the negative aspects of technology and impacting people. And then this course is about the potential positive um, aspects of technology and electromedia in relation to counterculture. So how different countercultural groups like LGBTQs and um, uh, the LGBTQ community and Black people and Latinx people and poor people, how they would use electromedia and architecture and sound and um, this whole club culture, which is basically like this participatory theater and utopia to enhance the possibilities in, the, in this constant um, dialogue between electromedia and counterculture um, and architecture um, continue to improve and create these new worlds and possibilities. And so um, that's just generally been my practice and it's something that is a space that I continue to explore in of a, a constant loop of um, research and creation and then cr turning all of that into a class and seeing what students do with it and learning from them and then going back and doing more research and creating um, in a space that I found um, that I'm able to explore a lot of that in is, is in the institution that I developed while a graduate student, so um, called Afrotectopia. And so while a graduate student, um, I was exploring how um, excited I was about learning all these new ways of bringing together human interact, human computer interactive technology and doing it through an artistic lens. And then also found that it could be a really powerful tool to consider critical race theory and politics, but was doing all of this in what felt like um, a very a siloed environment like I was I felt very um, isolated in that I didn't really any, see any other black people doing this kind of work so I didn't know of anyone that was black and creating doing creative technology I didn't have any black mentors or full-time professors in the program very few black classmates and so I, I wanted to explore what would this be like um, what, what would it be like to study the possibilities of technology through a, a racial lens and to be surrounded by other black innovators because I knew they existed I knew this I wasn't some sort of anomaly it was really just I just didn't I didn't know of them and we hadn't built a community together so it was building that community and it was also I wanted to show other black people that have grown up in the way that I did where you never see someone that looks like you doing this kind of work that this is something that we actually can fit this is a world that we actually should exist in like this is a space for us and we're very welcomed and invited to be in and so so it's really showing this world um, to more people and allowing them to see other people that look like them that are within this world. So after having announced it um, and creating it with a zero dollar budget, there was no money that I had in building it, but it was a, a, a very aggressive form of fundraising around the university and eventually other um, larger institutions like Google and Facebook and other companies were interested and started to support and it sold out quickly and we had our festival, hundreds of participants um, that were all really in a similar vein, but they also came from very different backgrounds and since the fruition of Afrojectopia it's been about how can we um, bring together a variety of different people, um, similar to what Victor Papanek says about an interdisciplinary form of design. If we're thinking about designing healthy Black futures, we need to have a lot of different people at the table talking about their expertise and have across um, conversations. We've also existed as a summer camp. So last summer, we had a summer camp for a free summer camp for high schoolers and middle schoolers. We also had um, our second festival at Google this past summer. We had the School of Epigetopia um, almost a year ago. In January it was hosted by Verizon Media. So this was, um, it's always of a similar vein. Every All the work that's coming out of Epigetopia stands on the pillars of art, design, technology, black culture and activism. And so this was doing um, similarly of uh, creating a, an, a, an environment where people could come and learn about um, one class by Nabil was computing and climate change and black futurity or another class by Jackie was the value of your digital self or another class by um, rad was I felt that so physical motion design and cinema 4D so exploring how technology and race and politics and um, art all have a relationship between each other and there can be you know different ways of combining them to create new ways of learning. And we more recently had an Imagineer fellowship um, and I'll wrap up with the way that we 
um, the way that the Imagineer Fellowship was constructed, it was a month and a half long and it was 10 different fellows and they each got $1,000 each to um, explore a variety of different things. But from the beginning, the, the objective of the fellowship was about individualism versus community. And I, I really should switch this and say community versus individualism because that's that was really what was being um, the goal and what we were striving for is how can we make fellowships and residencies be a communal practice where it's not so much of this artist gets a lump sum of, it's not only, I mean, I, I'm someone that does a lot of residencies and I love the opportunity to just dive deep within my practice with the support of an institution. But I also am excited about spaces where you can communally do this, um, of explore ideas in tandem with other people and build community with them and, and, and realize new possibilities um, through collaboration. So in curating this group of innovators, it was really about um, creating a space that was omni-specialized in the same way that Afrodotopia has existed and since its fruition of it's a space where urban planners and civic technologists and um, digital humanity studies um, students and game developers and machine learning scientists, all of them were coming together and community organizers were thinking about um, their practice in relation to each other's and how we can design these future cities. It was about understanding that blackness is not a monolith and that's something that um, I feel like often gets assumed that black people all have the shared experience and they all um, you know, have a, a shared understanding of what blackness means, but really the identity of blackness is so nuanced and it changes a lot based on someone's ethnicity or geographical location or you know, social economic standing or whatever it is. So this fellowship was also about um, emphasizing that like we had black people that were Mexican Americans or Honduran or black British or Haitian or Beninese or French, they were coming from all over. And so they had their own understanding of what blackness meant to them and representing um, these ideas within the work. And that it was people coming from a prismatic collection of perspectives. So it's again, continuing along this vein of blackness is not a monolith. And there are a lot of different identities that are within this idea of overall um, umbrella for, uh, idea of blackness where we have sexuality. So we had people that were queer or binary or trans or um, gender fluid. We had people that were first generation or maybe have lived here for generations or families lived here for generations or maybe working class to middle class to upper class. Um, so making sure that we had a full breadth of people's uh, lived experience. And then rooting this work in the way that I root my own work um, and, and presenting this to the fellows that Technology is merely an extension of human capability. And we often we think that technology is synonymous with digitality and that technology means a computer or a phone or an algorithm, uh, a digital algorithm. But really technology is, is purely just an extension of capability. And if we exit out of this idea of human centered design, technology is merely an extension of sentient capability. So all living things have used technology in some form to enhance their way of life or to evade struggles, um, ant farms, uh, cows, everything is evolving, constantly figuring out what can they use to ease in, um, to, to lessen the struggles within their lives. And so, as I mentioned, the fellows, they came from all over. They were from all over the US, from Florida to Texas, to Ohio, to Connecticut, to California, to the UK, Ghana, and France. And the Imaginariums, we had both the Imagineer Fellowship and then we also had Imaginarium. So Imaginariums complemented the work of the Imagineers and that they these were public gatherings for Black people to come and explore the same research that the Imagineer Fellows were doing. So there was a constant dialogue between the public and the Fellows. And so in the Imaginariums, they were tasked uh, with, they were invited to listen in on a really prolific speaker that was working within an area that we were focusing on for that week. So we had people like Ayoda Mola Kunsende and Olelek and JFS for Designing Future Cities and Olivia Michaela Ross for Black Radical Technoculture. And then they broke, I broke them up into smaller groups so that they could have small conversations between each other, but also so that they could build community amongst each other and get to know who they are. Um, and then while they're doing that, they're brainstorming on possible solutions for the prompt that we may have started for that week. And then we come together for a collective conversation. So we're able to you know, share these insights that we developed within our smaller groups and come and learn together from each other and understand um, and, and create a, a larger conversation of what a future might look like, how will, how will we create this? And so the goals generally were to build a vibrant international multidimensional black micro community of innovators to contribute to and create healthy visions of black futures from a prismatic collection of perspectives 
and to develop open source interdisciplinary pedagogy. So to make sure that everything that we were creating was being contributed to the larger public. Anyone else would have access to the work that we were doing. And so the fellowship, we had different weekly projects. We created a syllabus on our very first day. And so we had these different projects that we were gonna focus on. And then they filled in over time with just a bunch of readings and things to listen to and decided what we were gonna read for the upcoming week to be able to reflect on. And so each week that we gathered, it would be on Sundays from 10 to 5 a.m. to 10 to 5 p.m. We would gather and we would reflect on the readings. We would have a guest presenter. So here you see Rafael Sergio Smith, who was design director at IDEO, talking about solar powered reparations and all these projects that he developed on his own. We would vision map and think of what are the, like, what are some things that are standing out to us the most as we think about these different ideas. Then we would move to prototyping. So they would um, use this business canvas model to just elaborate on what a potential solution for this problem we're facing could be. And then I would turn all their prototyping into visual language so that I could just share it online easily. And then other people could build off the work that the fellows had done. And then they would wrap, they wrapped up the fellowship by presenting all their work. We had a, a, a convening with supporters and people that were interested. And they also wrapped it up by writing different essays on their experience and the research that they had done and, and just all these different things that they were exploring. And they're really beautiful essays. I would suggest anyone to read them and, and look at the things that they were thinking about. So the, the largest goal of Africtopia in general, and especially with the fellowship, was just to plant seeds for radical imagination. We don't often have enough spaces to just explore and think about what the world might look like if we had access to this, or you know, what, what would happen if there was no more racial inequity? Like, what do we want um, when we're, we're, we no longer need to protest? What is this world that we wanna live in? And so it's really important to just create opportunities for us to do that. So I'll just leave you all with, um, a couple of philosophies that I really um, hone in on is that it's always important to create space for imagination because it's manifestation. The th things that you constantly think will become true end up manifesting themselves. So um, be careful for what you wish for. They always say, but really also spend time um, very intentionally imagining these worlds that you want to live in and these futures that you want to exist within because it can be a form of manifestation and that everything is feel fluid and there are no silos so there's always a relationship between a variety of different information and it's always just about pattern recognition and finding what's that relationship and how do i want to create with it so thank you and i'll leave you with these different social handles where you can learn more about the work I guess we can move into Q&A. Thank you so much, Adi. You're welcome. Um, if people want to ask questions, you can put them in the chat or in the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand and I can let you speak directly to Adi. I will say I really appreciated, I mean, your talk was so comprehensive and wide ranging and that's obviously part of your practice and orientation toward all of this. And, but I really appreciated how much you talked about pedagogy as part of your research and your practice. And I think a lot of people give an artist talk and they don't talk about what they're doing in the classroom and how, you know, I think that your practice being community-based and creating opportunities for students and also being engaged with students and seeing what they do with all of this. I just thought that was really exciting and dynamic to see. Thank you. <laughs> I think people are soaking it in. <laughs> <laughs> Something that I also thought that was super interesting about your presentation is really moving from human-centered design into ecological design to really like de-platform that human exceptionalism that I feel is so often like wrapped up in whiteness and start like moving towards a future that is inclusive for all sentient beings is so radical and incredible and just like makes me feel all tingly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
so next we do have a participatory workshop, uh, which Megan has put a link to in the chat. Um, and so after this conversation, we will be moving into that. Does anybody have anything else they want to ask? We do have a few questions in the Q&A now. Okay, great. Um, so the first one is what parts of the slash your work brings you joy and what parts do you find especially challenging? Um, parts that bring me joy, um, I think the whole process really for me is mm -hmm. a, a, joy, uh, a joyful one. I think just the opportunity to just read different books and understand what's going on in the world is a joy. Um, I think, uh, and I think it's, it's all just like a generally a flu fluid and kind of organic process of I read, maybe I can use something with it, maybe I won't, but at least I learned something with it. Um, and then I'll be introduced to a new technology and I'm like, oh, I want to try this with it. So I'll create that. I think probably the most the frustrating parts of it and the challenging parts is in being a technologist, you're, you, you never really become a master at one technology. Like you, you can, if you want to, but then it, the technology changes so quickly that you, um, you know, you're constantly, you constantly need to learn and learn new things. And sometimes you need to learn a whole different language or a whole just different way of thinking. Um, and I think one element of dissonance that I often have is that the technologies are often created by people that think in a scientific way um, that's not exactly artistic. So it's engaging with this technology in a way where I'm coming at it from an artistic lens. And I know like these are the things I wanna create with it, but I know I'm using a tool that's not intuitive in an in artistic way. It's intuitive in a scientific kind of way. And it might not be intuitive in that way, but it's just someone that understood how to build something, but they didn't really understand UX design or like all these other things that we um, are able to use in more um, fluid kind of technology. So I, I would say that that it's more of just like when I finally have the research done and when I um, know the project, it's then how do I just like express it um, technologically in a way that's also artistic. Um, so using those tools. That's wonderful. Um, our next question is, what are some of the tools you like to work with and have been fundamental for guiding your work? Some of the tools I like to work with um, are, um, hmm. tools, I, I don't know if they are, uh, they both are the fundamental ones and the tools. I don't know if they're the same things, but tools, general tools that I like to work with are, um, I have a modular synthesizer. I love exploring with my modular synthesizer. It's like, especially as someone that loves design, sound and si designing sound, it's such a tangible way to create these new um, sounds and an algorithmic kind of process where you're, you know, you're patching different cables and you're turning different knobs to realize these new sounds. So that's a tool I really love to work with. Um, things that have been fundamental. I don't know if tools exactly are fundamental for guiding my work, but I think it's just general philosophies of just being experimental, like just get in there and, and see what happens. Like um, they often say break stuff. I, I was never a kid that grew up like breaking technologies. I didn't buy stuff to break it apart. I loved them too much. Like I didn't want to, but I, I think in my practice with programming, it is very much about just like get in the code. I don't mind getting in code and just like messing around and seeing what happens. And I think that's just a way that you're able to learn of even if you have no idea what the code is saying, play with a few numbers um, and change it and see what it does. And then you're able to over time understand it. And I would also just say um, for me, like the things I mentioned that fundamentally guide my work, it's it's just the philosophy of, you know, things don't have to be siloed. Um, I'm thinking about people and sentient beings, like what what actually matters, like what what can be created that will better lives around me, um, those sorts of things. Hmm. Um, we have a few more questions too. Um, what are some of the common themes you see people desiring for their futures in these Afrotectopia discussions and workshops, et cetera? Some common themes. Um, we often talk about capitalism. <laughs> I think everyone's just pretty frustrated with capitalism and I, I understand it. I've, I've definitely been someone that's like, we need to destroy capitalism immediately. And then I've more recently been like, eh, I actually see a lot of benefit within capitalism. I see that there are a lot of ways that it creates um, very inhumane inequities. And I think that's just the worst part of it. But I also see it being a tool for encouraging um, productivity and creating and discovering new things. So um, I think there, there needs to be a lot healthier of a balance within our, 
um, economic systems, but we often talk about that and about um, in relation to capitalism, also debt and how that stifles opportunities. We talk about credibility. Um, being in African Utopia, we often have people that are very prolific within their fields, and then we also have people that are very prolific but would have no credentials, like on an academic kind of standpoint, but they just have studied and they learn a lot. And we also have people that haven't studied, but they have a lot of really incredible lived experience. And so we talk a lot about credentials and what does that mean, like going into a prestigious school school and using that as like a, a catapult into a successful career or, or maybe can we build our own systems our own black systems and without the need for you know all this like um other external validation so we talk about a variety of different things but I think those are the top of mind things Um, another question, like many here, I'm planning to explore the Afrotechtopia um, fellows after this. Are there particular creators, designers, authors focusing on building these new societies outright who you could highlight? Um, yes, plenty. And they are, <laughs> <we> have, <laughs> there are plenty of them. And they, we have videos of them on our uh, website. So you could definitely go i mean our yeah on our website or it's on our youtube channel if you just search afrotechtopia on youtube you'll find videos from last uh last year's talks we have um a whole video from this year's fellowship so you'll hear all about what those workers were doing um what those fellows were doing we also have essays that they've written if you go on the social media you'll see all these people that have presented in the past at the school of afrotopia or at the past festival so um there are plenty they're all over <laughs> Afro Tiktopia on YouTube. <laughs> um, can you give advice to young designers about how to start to expand in a more collaborative design process? Yeah, um, collaboration is a very interesting thing for me. Um, like I, I, I very much value and attend, tend to foster collaborative spaces, but it's also, you have to figure out what you wanna collaborate for. And people have different ways of approaching it. For me, I only wanna collaborate with people if I'm really, really excited about what they're doing, like personally collaborate with them. If I'm really, really excited about what they're doing and I can see that I can, I can learn a lot from them. But some people, um, but most of the time I'm not able to access like those kind of people. I think you just have to be careful with the way that you engage with, um, collaboration. Some people want to collaborate because they want to just, just because they want to build with other people. Um, and that's just something that they're interested in. And maybe they're just like a really social person. And that's like a way of socializing with other people. Everyone has their own intention. So I think it's first addressing why do you want to collaborate? Because there's always a need for collaborating. Um, but I guess I'm actually answering this question in like artistic collaboration. You're asking more of like a design process. Um, so for designers, um, I would say, designers when you are engaging with design process um it would be for one what's your project on like what area are you focusing on and then who are all the um practitioners that you can more immediately think of that have some sort of relationship with this so let's say like product design maybe you're making like a water bottle um and that's like your your design studio making a water bottle okay so you know that you need to speak with the company because they're designing the water bottle or whatever it is but then you also other stakeholders would be customers. So maybe it's um, people that ride bikes and they need to fit into their bike, or maybe it's people that go to gyms and they need to fit into that cup holder, or maybe it's people that just walk around so they need to hold it in their hand. So you're talking to a variety of different stakeholders, and those are some potential collaborators. You're also talking to scientists, who are the people that are making the bottle. Um, it's really just understanding who are all the different stakeholders and who are all the different expertise that would um, have something to do with this and then having conversations with people about what you're creating so um, if you're a young designer you're probably in school so talk to your professors or email your old professors um, but yeah I would say a big part of it is really just having conversations um, with different people um, next question are there platforms that you were surprised to find space for artistic work within science um, are there platforms to find space for? Um, not really. I think I'm, I'm not really surprised about anything having a relationship between each other anymore. Um, I think for me, it's of course, there's always room for relationships, artistic relationships with science. I think art and science, they share so much with each other that um, I think really they can always have a relationship between each other. So yeah, I would say not anymore. <laughs> Um, can you name a few formative experiences from your youth? Um, 
formative experiences. I'm trying to move through these rapid fire because I think we have two more after this. Um, so formative um, in my youth, uh, there was one time when I was in middle school that I read a book, or no, not a book, but I saw in a magazine, an article about Steve Jobs and um, just learning about the way that Steve Jobs was thinking about Apple and creating it as um, really being someone that was very intentional about um, the experience of the person that would be engaging with the technology and um, thinking about how to make this technology beautiful and inducing of creativity. So allow people to feel like they could become creative in engaging with this tool. And if for it to, to hold a special place in someone's life because it's like this, this technology that is ideally beautiful to look at and engage with. So um, for me, when I learned about Steve Jobs, I was completely in awe because that was so much of what I was thinking about of having grown up loving architecture and seeing architecture as an immediate form of art that would engage with people's lives every single day that would bring beauty to their life and um, some sort of like a, a nice uh, way of designing. So um, learning about Steve Jobs, learning about how Steve Jobs was thinking both about technology and about the experience um, made me feel like that was definitely a space I wanted to explore too. Um, I found your point about creating common languages among silos compelling. Any strategies or recommendations for bringing together and facilitating collaboration among a variety of beings or expertise? Um, yeah, I think um, a lot of it is just there is something shared between the group and that's what's calling them in. So with Afrotectopia, um, it wasn't like a, the, I think you, you, these kind of things just happen really organically. Like with Afrotectopia, I didn't create a poster saying, I want lawyers, you know, educators, public health officials, all these different people to come into the space. All I did was say, we're thinking about the future and we're thinking about it through an artistic and technological lens. So come if you're interested too. Like that was basically what the branding was. Um, and I think when you have that, like when you, you have a, a something that um, something uh, specific that people are being drawn into and it's also done in a welcoming way where people feel like even if I don't know how to code, even if I don't you know, know how to create art, um, there's something here that maybe I can gain from. I think it's just like a welcoming kind of element um, and it's people surrounding around this one particular idea. So um, I would say that that usually creates the most organic um, kind of communities where people are coming from all over. All right, and our last question, it's a little bit longer. It is so striking to hear about your, or to hear how your practice is not only spanning practices and disciplines and subject matter, but also scales. The personal practice, the solo and collective research, the classroom teaching and the festivals, fellowships, institutes and events, you're spanning so many levels of access and experience. Do you have a favorite? And do they relate to one another in your practice sequentially or rationally? Uh, thank you. Yeah, you can see um, that question, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, a favorite, I mean, I'm, I'm, as much as I, it's a, such a complex uh, thing, but as much as I love um, community and it's one of the most important things to me, I also really value like solitude and just being on my own and reading books and learning and all of those things and research. So um, I think for me, it's really, um, and I think community is also something that I do build even not just for myself, but I think even more for others. Like I understand how important it is um, for me to be exposed to other people, but I also know that um, just the way that I learn, I, I can be okay doing it pretty in a, as pretty siloed form and that it's really about just creating a space where everyone can just see each other. So I don't know if I have a favorite or I probably would say guiltily my favorite is being alone <laughs> and like researching, but I think uh, what's most successful is um, creating a community where people kind of bring in their own things. But I understand that they both have a relationship between each other. Me um, spending a lot of time just thinking and brainstorming on my own allows me to come into a different space um, with like a like a, a full vision that um, that's definitely not complete. It, it requires the input of other people, but it's a, enough where people have enough to you know critique and understand. So with things like Afrojectopia, a lot of it I'm just building on my own and I'm ideating and thinking about it, and then I present it um, in the form of a festival, and it's 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 filled with enough vision where people can enter and feel like 
um, you know, they're, they're a part of something, but there's also so much room for them to make it their own and to change the way that things are going and to stand up and, you know, speak in front of everyone. Like there's, it's just like, it's finding that balance of, for me, it's really about creating this space in a very specific way, but then um, making sure that there's always um, space for other people to bring themselves into. Thank you so much for this talk. <laughs> um, I think that ends our Q&A session. Um, again, Ari is leading a um, workshop at 12.30, so we get a little bit of time, rest and recuperation. Um, the link is in the chat, so I hope to see you guys there. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>